Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to take a look at Subcrawl, which is a framework that was developed by myself and some colleagues at HP in order to help um, really look for, discover open directories, and then, and then categorize and identify interesting content on those open directories. Um, so before we get into Subcrawl, uh, just real quick, what is an open directory? Well, uh, an open directory is just simply a web server that's been configured to allow certain directories, sometimes it's the whole web server, to provide a listing of the content instead of rendering a specific page or maybe denying access. So here you can see an example. This host, uh, the directory um, at slash 70, is an open directory. It's listing all of the contents here. Now, with this particular directory, we really, there isn't much here. There's a single file, vbc.exe. But if we were to, you know, navigate by clicking that parent directory, we'd go back up closer to the root of this actual server, we might find additional, um, additional directories, additional content to discover. Uh, lots of servers will have additional directories here, in which, then we in which case then we can start to recursively explore going into those directories as well. So what Subcrawl was designed to do was to, you know, given a, a set of URLs, to try to discover open directories on those servers, and then again, um, identify and, and sort of categorize as much of the content that's there finding out what's really interesting. If we go back to Subcrawl then, uh, this has been published on the HP Threat Research um, GitHub, so you can find it there uh, uh, under Subcrawl. And the README here is, uh, I think, provides a pretty good introduction to the tool, but that's really what I'm, I'm trying to summarize in this video, is, is provide a high-level overview of what Subcrawl is, how it operates, how you can start using it, and then get into a demonstration. Um, there's quite a bit more than what we're going to cover here, so this will likely become the first of, of many videos introducing um, Subcrawl and, and how to use Subcrawl to hunt for threats using open directories. To begin then, as we start talking more specifically about Subcrawl, uh, you can look at this diagram that, that we created in order to provide an overview of the main components. Um, starting on the left-hand side, we have the input sources, and those are all URLs. Um, we have two modes. We're going to just look at what we call kind of this one-shot mode. Um, there's also a service mode, in which case you can, you can set up Subcrawl to really just kind of run indefinitely in your environment. Um, with one-shot mode, it's dependent upon an input file. So we're going to use that today. We're just going to put a URL or some URLs into an input file and then feed those into the Subcrawl engine. Um, in service mode, you can create input modules. There's, there's a, quite a few different modules that we'll talk about today. Um, we tried to keep the framework as modular as possible so that the use case could be quite flexible, adaptive to what you're, what you're really looking for. Um, with those input modules then, kind of out of the box here, you get URL house and fish tank, um, two places that have a good, a, you know, really good and up-to-date collection of URLs that are almost exclusively serving malware or, or, or related to malware in some way, shape, or form. So those are pretty good places. Um, we'll likely use the URL house here today uh, to grab some URLs for an input file as well. We get to the core then. Uh, so as the engine starts up, it'll parse the configuration file. We'll take a look at that here real briefly. Um, it then you know, begins to collect input URLs from those input sources. And then we have uh, two different modules, processing modules and storage modules. The processing modules are um, modules that can process content received from HTTP responses. So we have the raw content, we have the headers, we can generate things like you know, SHA sums. Those modules then can process that data, and we'll use a couple of those today. Uh, storage modules are just that then. Um, as the engine is generating and collecting this data, then where do you want to store it? Uh, we have a, an integration with MISP. Of course, you, you have to have MISP set up in order to use that one. We have a very simple console storage. It'll just print to the console. That's the one I'm going to demonstrate today. And then also um, just finished working on an elastic module, which is a pull request is open as a, the time of this recording. That should be into the main branch here many time, hopefully before, by the time this posts. Um, but just in case it's not, there is an elastic module with, some, with a default dashboard, some default visualizations. And that, of course, allows for a more persistent storage of the data more analysis, more trend analysis of, of, the, of the, you know, the data you're generating over time. Um, if there, we'll go through the installation. There's some, you know, some instructions here on how to get started. Uh, there's some instructions on the service mode and, and then using Docker in order to get that mode running. Some very brief built-in help. Uh, and then a description of the different modules as I, as I tried to summarize there just a few seconds ago. So more processing modules than I'm going to touch on today. 
we're just going to look at Yara and Payload and then the storage modules as well down below. So um, all of this here, you know, at least is documented to some level on the readme for our GitHub. Now uh, for getting started then, I'm gonna use this host as an example. I'm gonna just place this file um, or that URL into a single file. Uh, I don't really need to do anything else to the file because the engine will go ahead and, and what it'll do is it'll trim off the resource that was actually requested. And then from here, it will also then one by one uh, remove any of those subdirectories in order to generate new URLs for scraping, for crawling, and make sure that there's more complete coverage. That was something that I wasn't seeing with some of the other tools that were out there at the time that were, were developed for you know, really hunting open directories is that they would really stop at the URL that I provided. And I have found through my own experience that oftentimes you know, servers, especially if there's multiple subdirectories, you know, the directory you start in may not be an open directory, but a directory below that, or maybe two below that, that's actually open. And so then there's a lot of the potential to harvest a lot more content from there. So we'll keep that file, just paste it into a, any, any text file. Um, I typically call these .url or .urls, that's just so I can keep things straight when I'm doing a lot of scraping or, or crawling activity. Um, the next is to get a uh, subcrawl. So probably the easiest thing to do is to get the URL from uh, from the GitHub page. Okay, so what we uh, what we can do then once we get that URL is just to use a git clone and I'm going to provide a an additional or a new name for the directory that's created that this project will be cloned into. I'm just going to call this subcrawl-demo. Um, that way uh, I've remembered to remove this instance since I have another one already set up. Uh, so that should not a large project, just takes a few seconds there to clone. And then we can, after that, we can move into the directory. Um, something to note here, if you look at on this particular version of Remnix, it still ships with Python 2. And for Python 3, the default version is, is 3.6.9. Um, we do have some dependencies on Python 3.8. And so you'll see me explicitly using that version of Python. Probably the more appropriate is that I just update the installation or update the environment to use that version, but I, I guess I got a little lazy for this demo and just installed it on top of everything else. So that, that means that whenever I call Python, I am doing Python 3.8, as you can see there. So just a note, in this directory, not a whole lot. There's the readme and the license. The uh, important directory is to get into the crawler. Uh, and then from here, I'm gonna go ahead and we need to make sure that all requirements are met. So any uh, Python dependencies, we do have a requirements.txt file that you can use. So using pip, uh, we'll install and dash r with that requirements.txt to make sure that everything is available. That takes a few seconds to run. And again, depending on kind of the state of the packages on your system, there might be a little bit more install than uh, what you just saw here, but that should catch all of the requirements. Um, once that's complete, we just can run uh, subcrawl, whoops, subcrawl.py dash h, that'll give us help, and uh, should be a good indication that all dependencies are met, that we're ready to go and, and start scraping. So as you can see, um, not a lot really to get started with here. Uh, dash f is the file, that's that run once mode, so that's the mode I'm gonna be using to provide that input path. We have um, dash k, dash dash Kafka, that's really for service mode, as it uses a, as a queuing system, to, to collect URLs from those input modules and drop them on a queue. And then based off of how frequently you have um, subcrawl running in service mode, it'll pull URLs off of those queue to process that. So not a factor today for this video. Uh, dash P, processing modules. So we'll define those and then dash S, storage modules. And you can define multiple modules for each of those, dash P, dash S. You just have to separate them with a comma. So let's see here, Python. 3.8, uh, subcrawl.py. There we go, so dash F, and then the path to our URL, uh, dash P. So I'm going to use the Yara processing and the payload processing. And um, the documentation shows what the names of those modules are. If you're just not sure, you can always go kind of dig into the code a little bit and you'll find the name of the class for that module and, and that's actually the name. Um, dash S, 
Uh, it'll be our, our storage. I'm sorry, console storage. And now we're all set. So what we can do is start the engine and you'll see that we have logging that is available. So not only are we gonna get logging in real time, there's also a log file that is generated by default in the, the, the crawler directory here. Um, and, uh, and then based off of the storage module, we'll, we'll determine how persistent that data is. Console storage though, we just get the output that you see here. It provides a, a, you know, kind of a rudimentary summary. It's gonna be organized per host. So every host will be listed here. We only crawled one host, so we don't have a lot of results. And then inside of that result for that host will be any, any matching payload processing or any, I'm sorry, any, any matching processing modules. So we had a match in the payload processing. As we saw, there was a file there, vbc.exe. You kind of guess it's an executable. Well, payload processing identifies by using the lib match. So we can see that, yes, in fact, it is a PE32. Um, and that's the rest of the string from the results of libmagic along with the SHA-256 of that file. Had there been a match from another uh, processing module such as Yara, then any Yara rules that match would also just be summarized per host in this console storage. As you can also see, as the crawler is running, it is submitting or kind of emitting um, informational messages along the way. In this case, because that payload matched in that payload processing module, there was an informational message that a PE file was found. And the reason that we did that was just so that you could see that, res if, you're, if you're actually watching the crawling, you can see that information in real time versus having to wait for that summary information to come. Okay, um, just a note on the configuration. So oh, just opening up an editor here, Visual Studio Code and the, the subcrawl project that I just cloned. Um, underneath that crawler subdirectory, you'll find config.yaml, so YAML-based configuration. Most of the options here are hopefully fairly self-explanatory as to what purpose they serve inside of the engine. Um, and so I guess if anything isn't, please feel free to reach out. But um, the one I did want to point out, because maybe it's not quite as clear with some of the values that can be provided here with the log level, we have different log levels. We have informational, we have informational um, debug, warning, and error. And as you kind of traverse through the different levels, it increases really the verbosity of the engine. So informational is a good one and that it just provides you know, what you saw, right? Just basic kind of critical information that shows you that the engine's running. Um, I didn't point out, but the, this, these messages leading up to it beginning to do the crawling, you saw a confirmation of the storage modules, confirmation of the processing modules, um, input sources where it's getting the input URLs, ultimately how many unique hosts it found, and then information here about the number of URLs that it's actually generated. So the number of URLs that not, were not only input through the input modules, but then generated through that process of you know dropping off the resource and then kind of traversing through each one of the subdirectories to make sure we, we get as complete of a crawling uh, experience as we can. Uh, and then after that, once it started, then we just have input as, a, as, you know, again, or we have output as the engine is running. So you could change, for example, if we wanted to change this to debug, which is the mode that I'm using anytime I'm making changes or maybe things just aren't working the way that I'm expecting, um, you'll see that you're going to get uh, a little bit more information. Again, that one URL um, it didn't, it's just not enough to generate too much. Here you can see that process of generating new URLs. Here you can see some information about, okay, it, it did actually start um, trying to explore content from you know, the root of the server in this case. Uh, it did discover some content here um, and then you know, identified it through that processing module. So there's a number of configuration options that you can explore in order to determine or, or kind of change the way that uh, subcrawl is going to behave. Um, excluded files, for example, found very, I found through just scraping thousands of different sites, uh, a lot of times these files really didn't provide a lot of value, them, you know, or, or they were very, and they, or, and, or they were very common on servers. And so then they would just take more time in the crawling because every time it discovers a new URL in order to identify what type of, of content is there, is it a directory? Is it an open directory? Is it a PE file? Yeah, you know, it's got to make a request, get the response, and then go ahead and process that. And so in order to help speed that process up, you know, any 
any any you know URL that it discovers, if it has one of these extensions, it can just skip that whole process of trying to, to, to actually crawl it and to discover what's there. So it eliminates what can oftentimes be costly or time-consuming HTTP requests. Okay, uh, one way then to get more than a single URL is to use a service like URL House. They have an API and, and you know, many different ways in order to interact with that API. An easy way is to just simply use curl and through that curl command, of course, everything is documented on the URL House uh, and their API documentation, so you can check that out. Um, but uh, curl is one way. We can provide a tag for the type of, of URLs that we want to discover. So if we say tag equals Hyodo, then we're just looking for any URLs that have been tagged for Emotet delivery. Um, the URL is API URL. And then I'm going to have a series of redirections for that output because what URL House will return is, you know, very, very detailed records for each URL. It's not just the URL. It's the URLs, the date submitted, it was when it was blocked, who's blocked it, additional signatures, malware families. There's a lot of information there. So I'm going to use JQ to refine that and get just the URL because that's all I want. Then I'm going to use said to remove the double quotes because when I extract with JQ, those values will be wrapped in double quotes. And... I, we just haven't fixed the engine to uh, for that to not be an issue. So that input file has to have URLs. It can't be wrapped in double quotes. And then the last thing we'll do is just dump that to a file. So that'll just take a second to generate for us. And then looking at the content here, you can see there's all of the URLs that were returned to us from the URL house. Okay, when we download those results, the default is to get a thousand results at a time. And while that's usually great, the more the, the merrier. Um, for this demonstration, I'm just going to trim that down a little bit. So I ran split on that original uh, file, hyodo.urls, and just split that into files of 100. And that will generate however many files are based on that content. So a thousand results, 100 files, that'll be, or 100, 100 per file, that'll be 10 files. Um, the result will be XAA, so I'm just going to simply move that, rename that hyodo.urls, and now we're ready to begin scraping using our subcurl engine. So just like the previous example, um, we can just provide the path to the file using the dash F argument. And just like previous, um, I did go back real quick, but not in the video, and I changed that log level back to info just so there wasn't quite so much there. Um, it did find 92 unique hosts in that file and generated 188 URLs just to get started. And then as it's scraping any additional URLs that are discovered, particularly through those open directories, those are gonna get added to the internal queue. And so there'll be you know, more URLs typically that are, are typically found and actually scraped. Of course, one thing to keep in mind is that this is very much dependent upon finding open directories. If it does not find an open directory, it really doesn't do much with that host because that was the whole you know, motivation. That was the whole purpose behind the engine. Uh, so as it's beginning to do the crawling, you may not see very many results. And it is it is scraping. It is trying to identify the content in the background. We have added several places, um, timeouts, and other ways of just making sure that it doesn't get stuck at any host. We've seen things where there's infinite redirects. There are, you know, really large files, files that could be several gigabytes that probably, you know, we I didn't typically care to download those. I really didn't want to waste the bandwidth or the time downloading those as well. You know, t definitely we've, we've run across some misconfigured, intentionally misconfigured servers that have caused us some issues. So there's several things in the engine that try to limit that, those behaviors so that it doesn't get stuck or dwell on a host for too long. Uh, that's all I wanted to cover in this video, just to get you up and running, give you the basic idea behind subcrawl and then some, uh, you know, some use cases for it. We'll take a look at the different modules here in detail, and I'll provide some additional videos going forward. We'll also take a look at service mode. And of course, if you have any feedback, please let me know. Otherwise, stay tuned to the channel, and I'll talk to you then.